Good evening, everybody. To start this evening, I would love to welcome our school captain, Sophia White, to acknowledge country. As members of the Marici College community, we would like to acknowledge the living culture of the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of this land on which we are meeting today, and recognize any families who have connection to the land. We pay respect to elders past and present and the stories that have been passed down for thousands of years to educate and inspire generations to come. We appreciate the significance of connection to country and all that the Ngunnawal people have done to preserve the land that the foundations of Marici are built on. We aim to strive for reconciliation and justice in all we do, say, and are as a Marici College community and beyond. I would now like to welcome our spirituality captain, Kaylin Edgehill, to lead us in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We stand before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather together in your name. With you alone to guide us, make yourself at home in our hearts. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. We are weak and sinful. Do not let us promote disorder. Do not let ignorance lead us down the wrong path, nor partiality influence our actions. Let us find you in our unity so that we may journey together to eternal life and not stray from the way of truth and what is right. All this we ask of you, who are at work in every place and time, in the communion of the Father and the Son, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Kaylin. A very, very warm welcome to Marici College. I'm Anna Masters, and I'm privileged to be the principal of this wonderful educational institution that's been here for quite a while now, and I'm in my fourth year and very blessed to be so. So I take great pleasure in welcoming and inviting His Grace Archbishop Proust to say a word, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Good evening, everybody. We received some very sad news this morning. And perhaps uh, you've heard already that our beloved Archbishop Frank Carroll died this morning at 10 a.m. Uh, in Wagga Wagga. So he has been a giant leader in our community here at, in Canberra and Goulburn Archdiocese and uh, before that, of course, in the Wagga Wagga Diocese, former uh, president of the Australian Catholic Bishops' Conference. So will we just pause for a moment in silence and place his life before the mercy of Jesus? Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. May he rest in peace. Amen. But um, tonight, uh, of course, we are here because um, in this year of the Holy Spirit, we're so delighted that Father Timothy Radcliffe has accepted the invitation of the Archdiocese, particularly through Catholic Education and the Director Ross Fox, to be with us here and uh, welcome once again, Father Timothy. You, you have um, are well known. You uh, people have read your books and the people have seen the videos. And now to to see you here is great. And um, I had the honour last week at the retreat for the principals of all our schools to spend a bit of time uh, listening to Father Timothy at uh, at our retreat. And in the year of the Holy Spirit, I suppose the Holy Spirit's first role is to make Jesus alive. And Father Timothy, you certainly do that. And uh, the ancient definition of a theologian, the one who speaks the word of God. And if that's the definition, then you are a theologian with the big T. So we thank you for being with us. We're delighted to have you, and you're very welcome. Thank you, Anna.
I forgot to say I'm your MC this evening, so that's why I keep popping up. I'm very privileged once again to introduce Mr Ross Fox, the Director of Catholic Education. Thank you, Anna. Um, and thank you to Marici for hosting this lovely event tonight. Uh, this event is a joint initiative of the Archdiocese and Catholic Education. It's been several years in the making and it's an uh, important part alongside our recent uh, retreats and principal reflection of the Year of the Holy Spirit and is adding immensely to the reflection in that way. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome Father Timothy Ratcliffe, OP, to Marici College and to the Archdiocese. Father Timothy might not need any introduction, uh, hopefully, for many people here, but I just want to say or reflect on three things. Obviously, um, uh, it was the enlightenment of the Archdiocese to invite Father Timothy to lead a retreat, and then somehow Pope Francis also thought it was a good idea. We don't know exactly what order that happened or how the Holy Spirit was moving. Uh, Father Timothy, obviously, is a Dominican. I had the privilege of studying and spending time with the Dominicans uh, about more than 20 years ago. And Father Timothy is an amazing example of the Dominican order searching through scholarship and a commitment to excellence for truth. Uh, and I'm sure he'll share that wisdom with us tonight. He's a true exemplar of that commitment to search for truth through deep scholarship and prayer. Uh, one other thing that you may not know, Father Timothy was the master of the order of the Dominicans globally from 1992 until 2001. It sounds grand. Uh, I understand it involved meeting twice every one of the 5,000 friars globally, situated in 107 countries, everyone for half an hour twice over nine years. So you can imagine the amazing insight that Father Timothy has gained from that. Uh, Father Timothy is a very distinguished author, um, a very distinguished scholar, uh, is well known for his writing, his leadership, his theology. And just, uh, I, I actually first met Father Timothy more than 20 years ago in a British alehouse. It's no comment on how often he was there, and he does say that I owe him a pint, so I'll try and fulfil that, uh, that obligation at some point. And it was in a very auspicious establishment, which was known to be the home of the conversations between C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and others, the famous inklings at Oxford. Uh, so Fa Father Timothy is a, a wonderful uh, friar, uh, a wonderful priest, and we really look forward to hearing from you tonight. Uh, and deepening our understanding in the year of the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Father Timothy. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be back again in Canberra. The first time I came here was 1985, and I popped into Canberra when I was going by bus from Sydney to Melbourne. And then I got a wonderful welcome from my brethren. And I have to say, coming back here, everybody has been so immensely kind and welcoming. Perhaps above all, His Grace the Archbishop. Today I read a, 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 head, a headline in a newspaper about the wonderful Australian shepherds. I thought they were referring to the bishops, uh, but it actually turned out to be some sort of dog, uh, but no doubt it equally applies to the bishops. Uh, and Roz, you've been extremely kind uh, throughout this visit, and I look forward to the next pint uh, in the Lamb and Flag at Oxford. And I, I have to mention Tiffany, who's organized all my trip uh, with great kindness and generosity. So I'm very happy to be back, even though last night I found I was locked out of Archbishop's house and I was reduced to throwing stones <laughs> at windows. Some poor young priest was very suspicious. He said to me, stand in the light. Let's have a look at you. Who are you? 
but finally he let me in. I'm slightly embarrassed because I recognize quite a few faces that I've seen at previous talks, and I think this is about the 11th or 12th talk I've given since I arrived. But I draw courage from what Ros said. I asked him what was central to teaching, and he said, repetition. <laughs> so I'm obeying you, Ros, yet again, uh, repeating. One of my brethren, Herbert McCabe, suddenly realized he was due to give a lecture to the Leicester Theological Society. It was in 1980. And he grabbed a lecture from his father. He jumped on his motorbike. In those days, all Dominicans traveled by motorbike. And he arrived breathless. And there they were, stretched out before him, the Leicester Theological Society. And he picked up the paper, and it said on the top, given to the Leicester Theological Society. <laughs> I said, Herbert, what did you do? He said, oh, I left out all the jokes. They're the only things that anybody remembers. <laughs> I've been asked to talk about the Synod, and Canberra is a wonderful place to do so. Because, as you know, I'm sure, the name Canberra means, in the indigenous language, meeting place. And we're just in the process of celebrating perhaps one of the greatest meetings in the history of humanity, the Synod. Now, Synod, people feel puzzled by it. Synod is very simple comes from two words, sin, which means with, and hodos, which means the way. The first name of Christianity was the way in the Acts of the Apostles. To be a Christian is to walk in the way. And the synod simply means to walk the way together. And every time that the church has felt a little bit lost, unsure of how we should go, maybe our paths have been diverging, we have, since the beginning of the church, celebrated synods. I'll just get some water. Arguably the first synod was in AD 50, when the church was struggling about the admission of Gentiles of us, when the church gathered to see how to find the way forward together. Yves Congar, great, perhaps the greatest theologian of the last century, theologian of the council, he said synods are the ordinary Catholic way of government. They fell out of fashion a little bit in recent centuries, but they were revived by Pope Paul VI in 1967, and they've been held ever since. Now, this one was slightly different. It was a synod on synodality, and that sounds really ugly. What it means is we gather together as a church all over the world to reflect on how we are changed as a church, become really a community in which we listen to each other, in which the dignity of every baptized Christian, not just Catholic, every baptized Christian is recognized so that everybody has a voice, everybody's received the Spirit. And although it sounds ugly, it might even sound a little bit like navel-gazing, the church thinking about the church. But Pope Francis summoned it because we're at a juncture in the history of humanity where we desperately need hope. Given the rise of violence, the war in Ukraine, war broke out in the Middle East, 
while we were at the Synod. So in this time of conflict, when the future is so uncertain, when there's the threat of ecological catastrophe, when young kids in China have T-shirts saying, we're the last generation, then we need to have a church which is a sign of hope. And Pope Francis always insisted that the synod is a sign of Eucharistic hope. What is Eucharistic hope? Nick Cave, Australian rock star, I notice heads nodding in approval. Nick Cave said, hope is optimism with a broken heart. That's good, but I think we can go further. And I shared at the Synod my first understanding, my first glimpse of what Eucharistic hope is. I went to Rwanda in 1993, and it was just when the troubles were beginning that led to genocide. I arrived in Kigali, rather exhausted, and we were due to visit the Dominican sisters in the north of the country. And the Belgian ambassador came and he said, don't go. The whole country is on fire. But I was young and foolish. Now I'm old and foolish. And we set off and it was a terrible, terrible time. We saw awful things. Worst of all for me was this hospital full of kids who'd lost limbs through mines and bombs, arms, and that one kid I remember had lost two legs, an arm and an eye, and his father sat beside him weeping. And I wept. I went out into the bush, accompanied by two little kids hopping, each with one leg, and we wept. And then we went to the Dominican sisters. But I couldn't think what to say. What do you say in the face of all this meaningless violence? No words seemed adequate. But then I remembered there was something to do. How on the night before he died, Jesus gathered his disciples. He'd already been betrayed by Judas. Peter was about to deny him. The rest would run away. There was nothing ahead, apparently, except for failure and torture and death. And then he did this extraordinary thing. He took his bo the bread and he said, this is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for you a sort of mad act of self-gift that made no sense to anybody at the time. The meaning only began to dawn on Easter Sunday. So whenever we see no hope for ourselves, for our community, for our church, for our nation, our world, we celebrate the Eucharist because that is the hope when there seems to be none. It's God's promise that meaningless suffering will never have the last word. So this synod was not a political gathering. It was a gathering of the Eucharist, which we celebrated regularly. It was a time of silence. I've never been to a meeting where there was so much silence. After every two or three interventions, we had four minutes of silence to listen to each other, to listen to the Lord, to listen to the Spirit. Mass every day. We did miscalculate once with the Eastern Catholics, who of course take twice as long as everybody else. So breakfast was an hour late on that day. 
what was achieved? At the end of the synod, the media were pretty scathing. They said, what's all this razzmatazz been about? What have they done? There was a document which said that yet again, we would think about the ordination of women to the diaconate the third time. And what about welcome to gay people? Well, even the term LGBT, which the Pope has used often enough, was dropped. So people said, what a waste of time. And that's because it's easier, it's easy to misunderstand what sort of an occasion this is. Pope Benedict said something very interesting. He said there were two Vatican councils in the 1960s. There was the Vatican Council of those who participated, an event of faith, an event of the spirit working deeply inside people, organic change. And there was the event of the council as portrayed by the media, where it was seen solely as a clash between conservatives and progressives, a power struggle. And the same thing happened this time. The media couldn't get it. If you see the synod just as a struggle of two groups for power, left and right, whatever you want to call them, then you're just rearranging the deck chairs on the ecclesiastical Titanic. You're not really changing anything. What was at issue was something much more fundamental, which was a change even of the nature of power a new understanding of power. Not the power which dominates other people, but the power to empower each other. Now, Pope Francis insisted time and again, the synod, the Holy Spirit, is the protagonist of the synod. And what did he mean by that? Because that's crucial to understand what's, what is happening. And I would say three things, more briefly than I would like, but probably much more longer than you'd like. First of all, which I talked a lot about at the retreat for the principles, the spirit is the spirit of the divine friendship, which is transformative. Secondly, the spirit moves us out of our comfort zones, challenges how we see the world. And thirdly, which will be vital for the next meeting, the spirit leads us into all truth. So let's look at each of those briefly. The spirit is the spirit of friendship. Our religion is not a religion of the book as Judaism and Islam both are in different ways. Our religion is a religion of encounter with the Lord in which we become friends. We are baptized into the eternal friendship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Though I have to tell you there was a Dominican, Cardinal Brown, former master of the order. He'd been baptized in emergency by an ancient sister. And he went back when he was an old man and sought her out. And she said, yes, your eminence, it was a great honor to baptize you in the name of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. <laughs> and he thought, oh my God, I've never been baptized. And then he thought, maybe her mind is wandering a little bit. You see it right from the beginning. When Moses sees that burning bush and he goes over, he encounters the one who will speak to him as a friend. I saw at Mount Sinai the bush that they claim was the original one, and beside it was a fire extinguisher. 
typical. Meet God and put out the fire. So this first part of the synod was encountering each other in friendship. Barriers falling. Being liberated from prejudice. We sat, I've been to three previous synods where I call we had an ecclesiology of hats. We had a white hat in the middle, a couple of rows of red hats, and then some purple hats, and then you had the great unhatted, <laughs> like me. This time, we sat at tables of 11 with cardinals and bishops, lay people, religious, people from all over the world. Everybody had to listen to each other. Each person had four minutes to speak in the first round. There were four rounds, always a facilitator who made sure that no one, no one spoke for too long. A senior Vatican Archbishop looked at them and he said, do you know what? Look at all those Roman curial cardinals. They're listening. They will never be the same again. And very often, I'm sure that they started, as is understandable, they saw members of the feminine, fem feminine members of our species, sitting around. But as time went by, they saw human beings, Susan and Sandy, our fellow disciples, people like themselves who were searching, fellow missionary disciples, as the Pope said. Ours is a religion of faces. If you go to a Catholic church, what do you see? Faces like in the Orthodox churches, where you have icons. Because the, the, the great desire of Israel was sit, to see the face of God. Oh, let your face shine on me, and I shall be saved. You could not see the face of God and live. You died. But when our God acquired a face, it was the face of a baby, and it was the baby that grew up and died, not us. Let me briefly recount a story which is very important for me in Algeria. When I was taken to the south of the country by a Dominican bishop, and the country was caught up in violence. And as we were driving around, we got caught up in the conflict ourselves. We saw the previous car, the people, occupants, taken out of it, at best to be taken hostage. And there was this young man standing in front with a stone poised over the windscreen. And we dreaded if he were to put that through our window, we would be gone. And I knew that the only chance was to look him in the eyes. And I saw at first the face of a young man who was filled with fear, hatred, hatred. And then slowly underneath, I discerned somebody who was afraid, a kid who was afraid, probably wondering how he got caught up in all of this. And then underneath that, I spotted a man whom his mother loved and whom I could love. And the root of all our ministry is learning to see each other's faces and read them. Because if you read another's face, you have to love them. And what you see is a glimpse of the one who made them, the one in whose image we are all made. And then we learn to smile. There is no Christian ministry without smiling. And I've been very touched, actually, since I came back to Australia this time, seeing those smiles incorporated 
in so many of your leaders. St. Martin de Porres, they said, his smile gave courage to the timid, comfort to sufferers, confidence to those who faltered, hope to the oppressed. Have you ever thought all those millennia of evolution, the face becoming flexible so that we could smile, and so in the end, that God could smile at us. Will this make a difference? Yes. I think it's profoundly transformative of who we are and how we are. It subverts what Pope Francis so detests, a sort of clericalism, which I don't think you have nearly as much here in Australia as in many parts of the world, where the priesthood is seen as a superior caste, unaccountable. And I understand this. I joined to become one of the brethren rather than a priest. I accepted ordination because my brethren asked me. And the day I was ordained, I remember my parents' parish priest came cantering up he commanded me to leave those heretical Dominicans. And then he fell on his knees and started to kiss the sacred hands, and I fled in horror to my room. And I only came down because I was pursued by a German Dominican who wanted to talk about Heidegger, and that was even worse. <laughs> I think one challenge for the church is to evolve an affirmative beautiful vision of the ordained priesthood. One that shows the priest immersed in the people. I first saw this, glimpsed it in Pakistan, visiting tribal people in the north of the country, where I saw one of the, the great assembly of people sitting on the ground wearing their native costumes. And there in the middle, I recognized their priest, an American Dominican, ordained for them, ordained not to be set apart, but to embody Christ's friendship. That's the friendship we need in this world. That's the friendship we need when you look at the, the conflict in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas. What other hope is there than that friendship might overcome hatred? I think of Neve Shalom, a place founded by an Egyptian Jewish Dominican, midway between a Jewish village, a Cistercian monastery, and a Muslim village, where three faiths can meet in prayer and silence. So that's the first transformative way that the Spirit is working through sharing in the divine friendship. That's what salvation is. It's to be embraced by the friendship that sets us free. The second, he looks at his watch anxiously, is the Spirit came upon us to move us out of our comfort zones. The Spirit is the great discombobulator. In the Acts of the Apostles, the early church gathers a small Jewish community and the Holy Spirit comes upon the church, sends them to the ends of the earth. What do they do? The apostles all remain in Jerusalem. It's only persecution that drives them out. It's a tough job for the Holy Spirit sometimes to change the church. My favorite image of this is this. In my office in Santa Sabina in Rome, there was a nest of kestrels just over the window. And every year they hatched little kestrels. And mum and dad kestrel would boot them out of the nest and I would see them hovering five feet in front of my desk, trying to fly. 
but they had to fly or die. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Fly. In this case at the Synod, I think we were being moved beyond a sort of Western-centric view of reality. We came to the Synod with our hot-button issues, the things we thought important, that we wanted to promote. And these are fine and good, and I hope that we do. But then we were challenged to move beyond our little world. I'm reminded of the member of Congress in America who when they had to vote on whether America would adopt English as an official language, she said, well, if English was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. <laughs> Often we've been under the misapprehension that West is best. <laughs> there you are. given to me at the meeting of the specially kept for this occasion, Ross. But we have to see how do we become brothers and sisters, flesh and blood of people who are struggling to survive. We have to see how here in Australia you are the brothers and sisters of people in Myanmar, Indonesia, East Timor, these are not strangers. They are your flesh and blood. And if we really make the effort to take on that identity, not primarily as Australian or British, but as citizens of the kingdom, it may cost us. It may be painful. We may become unpopular as Catholics did in Britain at the Reformation when we stood up for a Catholic universal identity, not a national church. Many of my ancestors were ritually disemboweled for this. What might it cost us? One of my brethren, Herbert, I mentioned earlier, he liked to say, if you love, you'll get hurt. You might even be killed. If you don't love, you're dead already. So here we actually meet a complex tension, which there isn't really time to analyze in any depth. We have to be open to all the cultures of the world, citizens of the kingdom. But Pope Francis also stresses that we must be open to all the marginalized in our own society. The church must be a home for everybody. He repeated it, all, 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 todos, 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 including the divorced and the remarried, transgender people, the gay people. But here we get a difficulty that we're trying to find our way through how are we simultaneously open to everybody, for example, our beloved gay friends, when we're trying to be open to cultures which don't accept them? This exploded recently in that document, Fiducia Supplicans, which gave permission for the blessing in very carefully described circumstances, the blessing for gay couples. And the, American, the African bishops almost universally rejected this. They said, this is not compatible with African culture. If the church is to be inculturated in Africa, we cannot tolerate this scandal. So what are we to make of that? Two imperatives, apparently in conflict or tension with each other. Do we say, actually, we must respect 
an African desire for an African Catholicism, which therefore has a different understanding of these things? Or do we say, actually, the gospel is always countercultural? Jesus was a Jew, but he was very countercultural. He criticized and acted against the culture. And I think two things I would say. First of all, given these tensions, it's extraordinary that at the end of this first part of the synod, over 95% of all the people accepted we must not discriminate against minorities, against people because of their sexual orientation. That's an extraordinary triumph, given that in over 30 countries of the world, homosexuality is still punishable by death. Secondly, it means that as the synod advances to the next stage, we're going to have to think. The time has come for much more profound reflection. You had a first stage of friendship, encounter, which is absolutely indispensable and transformative. But now we have to reflect upon issues. The word reflect occurs 21 times in the last document. We're going to need the help of theologians and other thinkers, other creative thinkers, so that we can discern what's a development of our faith or what would be a betrayal of our faith. What is really an enrichment or what will be a falling away. And at the first part of the synod, I think there was a certain fear of theologians, which is quite common in the church. When we produced the final document, I asked one friend of mine there, a woman I admire, I said, what do you think of it? She said, it's too theological. I thought, what does that mean? She said, abstract. It's a bit of a paradox that you think of theology as abstract when it's about the word becoming flesh. So we're going to have to find ways of bringing the theologians into the conversation, not to take it over, but to be dialogue partners involved in questioning. It's why I wrote that latest book with a young Polish Dominican, Łukasz Popko on 18 conversations with God. God engages, he enters into our lives often when we question, when we question God and God questions us. And this passion for truth is extremely important today in a society which has fallen out of love with truth. A society filled with fake news and mad conspiracy theories. About a quarter of all Americans believe in the mad conspiracy theory QAnon, which you've probably heard. And in this society which falls into your truth and my truth, which has lost the confidence that together in all humility we may seek the truth together. This, I think, will be a very important part of the next stage of the Synod. Thinking. I'm reminded of one of my brethren who's a philosopher sitting in a bus in London and he heard two people in front of him talking about how difficult life was. And one said, oh, my life is full of suffering. And the other said, well, you've got to take it philosophically. And the first one said, what does that mean? And she said, oh, it means you don't think about it. <laughs> so although the media dismissed the first part of the synod as a flop, 
It was not. The Holy Spirit is at work, transforming the church. Starting not so much with what, how we're structured, but who we are as people who listen together to the Spirit. But there's more work to do in the second part, particularly as we raise questions of interculturality, and you here in the States, in, in Australia, have so much to teach us. I was really touched when Sophia, at the beginning of this meeting, made that acknowledgement of the people who came before. You have delved into this, and you have something to teach the universal church. But secondly, as we pursue the truth, knowing that nobody's view is ever to be dismissed as nonsense. It was the one rule we had in the General Council of the Dominican Order, 14 of us from 14 nationalities. Your brother's view was never nonsense. It may be wrong, it may be arrived at because of bad information or arguing illogically, but always, somewhere, there was that grain of truth which we need to harvest. Thank you very much. Do you think it would be a good idea if we took a couple of minutes of silence, Anna? Because if we go straight into questions, often there's a terrible silence. Would that be all right? Just two minutes of silence to digest. The motto of the Dominican Academy in Baghdad is here no questions are forbidden. How blissful is silence. We have the great privilege now to open up to a Q&A. So we have some roving mics. And Father Timothy's been mic'd up. So would um, anyone like to ask a question of Father Timothy? Question, express an opinion, an idea. Share an experience. Tell me about the holiday. <laughs> Hi, Father Timothy. My name's Andrea. I was just wondering, how did it... Uh, you said a little bit about how it felt different, that like there was more silence. Could you just say what else surprised you about that experience, this different way of being church? I, I think what surprised me was... A I think it surprised everybody 
was that when we arrived and we looked around the room and we could see all sorts of opinions, we could see people who were well known for being in favor or against the Synod, people who we knew loved Pope Francis and quite a few who didn't. And what I think surprised us was actually the degree of happy consensus that we reached. And this was unexpected. No, we, we voted a number, well, I didn't. I was just an advisor. But the participants voted a number of propositions at the end. And none of them received less than 82% in favor. Most of them received more like 95% in favor. And that was astonishing. And what you get sense, therefore, was that for all the disagreements, and we want disagreement, disagreement is fruitful. Argument is fruitful, fertile. If we all think the same thing, it would be very boring. But there is that desire to climb out of the trenches and, and meet each other and be enriched by each other. So I think that was a genuine surprise. If I might add another thing, another unexpected thing, was the big role given to Eastern Catholic churches. Most people don't realize that there are lots of churches who are members of the Roman Catholic Church. We are most of us members of the Latin Rite. But there are lots of other churches who are just as Catholic as we are. And the Pope was determined that their tradition be honored, their richness be accepted. Uh, often they have strong traditions of synodality, married clergy, and all sorts of things. So one effect, I think, of the synod was to broaden, broaden our awareness of what it is to be Catholic. It's not just to be members of the Latin rite, though that is vastly the biggest one. But I'm sorry I stood between you and launching into your question. Uh, hello, Father. Thank you very much for coming on. Um, my question is about pace. About pace. Hello, testing. Aha, got it. Um, my question is about the pace, the pace of it all. Um, uh, you know, sitting here in the West a long way from Rome, um, I'm, I suppose I'm interested to hear from you whether there is an understanding that uh, things are quite, you know, on the ground, really quite in need of change. And uh, as I sit listening to you, I'm thinking, do they realise, you know, that time is of the essence. And so I'm interested to hear from you whether there is that sense of urgency uh, being felt and responded to. I think um, the great thing is not to think of them so much as a them, but to think of them as us. And I think mainly many, many of us, especially from the West, were deeply aware that a lot of people are hanging on by their fingertips. And, uh, and that is frightening. Because on the one hand, there are changes that many of us want urgently. Like, for example, I, I really hope for the ordination of women to the diaca. Um, but on the other hand, we also know that the church God's grace always tends to work slowly, which is very frustrating. Let me give you an example. When Jesus and his disciples went up to Jerusalem, they thought, great, the moment's come. We're going to throw out the Romans. All that imperial power is going to be destroyed. And it didn't happen. 
and Judas felt so betrayed that he left. Actually, the day after the resurrection, nothing seemed to have changed. The Roman emperor was still on the throne. Roman rule was apparently unshaken. But 300 years later, the Roman Empire was converted. And alas, alas, it's not for me to tell God how he should do things, but I, I understand deeply myself because of friends that I have, because of the church I live in, that longing for change soon. And I think we have to long for that, we have to pray for that, we have to hope for it, and not give up if it doesn't go as we think. I always think of Abraham and Sarah. God appears and he promises descendants, and then nothing happens. God appears again and he says, you will bear a child, your descendants will be more than the sand of the seashore. Lovely. Nothing happens. And then a third time, in chapter 18 of Genesis, your young Sarah is going to bear a child, and she laughs bitterly. Because she's heard it so many times, and nothing happens. And then she bears a child, whose name means laughter. So I think I do, and I think lots and lots of people, particularly perhaps from North America and Western Europe, feel deeply that sense of urgency and suffer from it and dread it not nothing being achieved as we would hope. But if sometimes you just have to say, God's ways are mysterious, and we remain. You know, in all these terrible crises we've been through, with sexual abuse, and, and so many of my friends who are women, uh, who feel on the edge and feel unrecognized, their voice not heard, sometimes, you know, people want to go. I remember on Paddington Station, meeting a bright young friend of mine, a great journalist, and after the last revelation of sexual abuse, and she said, I'm off. And I understand that. But what I get carried back to is the last words of Matthew's Gospel. I will be with you until the end of time. Jesus is going to be with us. And if he's going to stick it out with us, we have to too. That's what I think. And I think we can all be a French to me, Vincent de Canangle, always used to say to the brethren in French, of course, he said, courage and cowardice are contagious. And we have to each of us reflect upon whether we can be contagious of courage and hope or contagious of despair. You may have just answered this question, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Um, my reality in the pew each weekend, and I should say, this is my native diocese, but I don't live here any longer. So my reality each Sunday is of a church divided, badly divided. Um, I've just finished reading a, a biography of St Paul. I have a much better appreciation now of the uh, divisions and differences that existed in that apostolic church. The, the Council of Jerusalem that you mentioned... Um, gave some answers, but it didn't solve the problem. Those problems, I think, still 
still continue today. An understanding is God a demanding God who wants us to obey all sorts of food regulation and get circumcised and God knows why? Or is he an unconditionally loving God? I think that's the fault line. What's the practical way of, of us in the pews um, developing that message? I think the best way, you're absolutely right, do you mind if I sit down? Uh, I think the best way is giving the best possible interpretation to the people who think differently from you. And, uh, and possibly the best way is not to think of them as people who just want rules and regulations. It's to try to discern their faith and what they treasure and try to imagine why they treasure it. Um, I think imagination is utterly important at this stage in the life of the church. When you disagree with somebody, can you imagine why they love what they do? I'm not a great fan of the Tridentine Mass, but can I imagine why somebody is? Can I put myself in their skin? And one little example of how the Council of Jerusalem moved forward was that they didn't split. You had those four branches. Irenaeus talked about the four branches that were at the Council of Jerusalem. And they led to four Gospels. And in the second, early, the first, early second century, there was a temptation to say, well, I mean, Luke's obviously the only Gospel, isn't he? And I'll give that Luke? Who wants Luke? Got John. That's real theology. And there was a terrible temptation in those first two centuries either to try to use one gospel, which was a sort of synthesis, or to have my gospel and dismiss the others. And there's an extraordinary triumph of Catholicity when they said, we want all four, and we'll be held them together in the embrace of the New Testament. It's an extraordinary moment in the life of the church, holding on to plurality, four Gospels. And that's at the heart of Catholicism, universality. And I would say a last remark is there's always been tensions between what one might call the more conservative view of and a view that wants more change or progress, that's quite different from making a radical opposition. A radical opposition between progress and tradition is, I think, a fruit of the French Enlightenment. Left and right. Think of the Assembly Hall uh, after the French Revolution. And you get tensions throughout the history of the church, but this radical opposition is when I think what happens if we get too caught up in that enlightenment opposition, which it is, I believe, alien to Catholicism. My father loved change. He adored the Second Vatican Council. My mother wanted no change at all. She wanted Latin. My father said, okay, darling, so that's so that you can understand the mass nowhere. But they lived together because they both understood that it could be a tension that's quite different from the radical opposition which you often see in what you might call enlightenment countries above all the United States. Um, you spoke about interculturality, and uh, you, um, you know, applauded the um, welcome to country and what Australia might have to offer in this regard. Uh, I wonder, could we put a gloss on that or broaden it and speak about interreligiosity 
And um, there was just something that you said that um, I, I had to think again about, um, you know, in a questioning sense. And that was distinguishing Christianity from Islam and Judaism on the basis that they are religions of the book and we are a religion of friendship. Oh, and that wasn't quite the this. I was saying a religion of encounter. Of encounter, yeah. yeah. Of encounter. Personal encounter. Yeah. So we don't have the text isn't sacred in quite the same way that it is in Judaism and Islam. Mm -hmm. Which is why we don't have to bury all the texts, the sacred texts, in the same way that, that I think certainly Judaism but sorry, I interrupted you there. No, no, that's pretty much... Um, uh, yeah, it was just um, uh, questioning in me. Uh, I don't know whether you know of David Barrow. Um, he's a member of the Congregation of the Holy Cross. Um, I don't know whether he's still alive, but uh, a student of Islam as well as Christianity. And he's written on friendship. Uh, in Christianity and Islam um, in a way that would be, um, well, complementary to Islam. Um, I, I know that you uh, um, spoke the, about encounter, uh, the encounter of friendship, and yeah, that, that uh, centered in a different direction. Uh, but just on the um, understanding of friendship, um, I think, um, yeah, Islam is of some value there. Uh, and it was really just in the sense of um, broadening the interculturality in terms of interreligiosity. And I wonder, was there anything in the synod on synodality that um, would help in that direction? I, I think certainly you can see that for both Pope John Paul II and for Pope Francis, friendship with Judaism has been central. Pope John Paul II, in his childhood, developed close friendships with Judaism. And Pope Francis, as one of his closest friends, is a rabbi in Argentina, with whom he wrote books. So, and certainly in my own life, Jonathan Sachs, who is the chief rabbi in Great Britain, was a personal friend, and he's been one of the great religious leaders in Britain in the 20th century, and we feel his loss. And that's also true in different ways in Islam. And if I could just give an example, as a Dominican called Pierre Claverie, blessed Pierre Claverie now, who is Bishop of Oran in the west of Algeria, and he was killed. He was martyred because of his friendship with Islam. And uh, a Dominican, young French Dominican, Adrien Candillard, has written a wonderful play called Pierre et Mohammed. Because Pierre became a good friend of a young Muslim, his driver. And then on the day of Pierre's beatification, a play was performed in Oran, and Pierre's mother was there, and she went and kissed the actor who played her slaughtered son. And for the first time on the banner, every time you have a beatification or a canonization, they produce a banner which is hung out, and there for the first time, Pierre was on the banner. And when Pierre, was beat, when Pierre was ordained a bishop, he made a wonderful speech in which he said, I owe so much of who I am to my friendship with you, my Muslim friend. And so certainly I would say that that friendship had an extraordinary part to play in his life, in the life of the church, in the Maghreb, in the north of Africa. So I'm very glad indeed that you raised that, 
because it would have been terrible to omit that dimension. And friendship, generally, I think, with all those who seek the truth. Uh, in one of the, I can't remember whether it was last night or sometime recently, <laughs> from so many lectures, I can't remember what I've talked about. I talked about the Japanese Dominican Shigeta Oshida, who I loved dearly. And Shigeta described himself as a Buddhist who met Christ. And he had an ashram on the slopes of Mount Fuji, where I stayed. And there were Buddhists and Christians who shared the ashram. And he opened, certainly, the Dominican order and the church to the wisdom, the wisdom that came from that Zen Buddhist tradition. So we can always remember what Aquinas said. I always have to quote Aquinas where he said, all truth is from the Holy Spirit, no matter who speaks it. Aquinas was devoted to a pagan philosopher. In the first question of the Summa Theologica, he quotes a pagan philosopher, a Jewish philosopher, and a Muslim philosopher. Uh, his theology was deeply rooted in encounter with all, all those who seek wisdom. And I think what we need then is the confidence in our convictions, the confidence in our beliefs, and the humility to know that we don't fully understand them, and that therefore any wise person can help us on the road. So thank you. I'm so glad you raised that. Father Tim, Michael Lee, thank you so much for coming to this country and for being so very generous with your time in our Archdiocese. My question is, um, what advice would you give to Christian leaders um, in response to the refugee crisis here in this country on the Mexican border, the Italian coast and elsewhere in Europe? I think that's the most difficult question that we face. I mean, there are something like uh, over 100 million refugees at the moment. And with the climate crisis, that number is only going to increase. Parts of Africa are becoming more and more consumed by violence consumed by the desert, the Sahara is expanding. And so your question is extremely important and will become more so. I think, obviously, we have to welcome the stranger, welcome the stranger who is God, come to us. God comes as the guest. I think we have to do so believing that this can be a gift of richness. Um, in Britain, we have all these scare stories we live by. You'd imagine that 70% of people in England today are immigrants. It's crazy. And the media live by scare stories. So we have to, I think, look things in the face, realistically, and see, certainly in our case, the relatively small cut numbers that are coming, and who have so much to give us. At the same time, people complain that we haven't got nurses and doctors and people to work in the fields. We complain about the lack, and then complain about the migrants who want to come and do those very same things. So I think we have to think a lot about the effort to positively welcome them and create a multicultural society. Sometimes we say in Britain it's failed, sometimes we say it's succeeded. But I think we have to go on in belief, believing and in hope, because it's not going to go away. Thank you. Um.
Um, Father Timothy, it's great to be here. Um, my question is on um, your second um, preposition. With, um, so you talked about the tension between the culture and including everyone. Uh, and we, I understand we are at the stage of reflecting and thinking. Uh, my question is, how will the church influence cultures when it, sometimes it seems that the church is losing its influence over the cultures um, and in policy making or in any, like, you know, in those sort of things? Thank you. What do you think? I'd love to know what you think. I think all I'm called to is live as a good Christian and influence the culture as much as I can. Um, that's, yeah. But I'd like to know your thoughts. Uh, I, I'll just give the example of, of Rome, where in our general council, 14 nationalities, 14 members, 14 nationalities from five cultures. And you, we all had to learn a lot from each other. What solitude the different cultures hoped for. What ideas of friendship the different cultures have? What ideas of celebration? As you know, different cultures expect different distances. We Brits are well known for being frigid, cold people who want to keep everybody very far away. And I think it is a creative business. I don't think it's a question, much a question of negotiation as a creativity. Difference is fertile. Each of us is the fruit of difference, the difference between men and women. And I think every culture is fertile in so much as it engages creatively with difference. So I think we have to be drawn beyond that rivalry that competition, which is so intrinsic part of Western culture, where we see everything in terms of survival of the fittest, you know, the survival of the strongest, uh, and learn uh, how to rejoice in difference. I think that's a terribly generalized answer. But sometimes we will sit down and we will talk and listen, rather than a big, fat Englishman standing here and pretending to have the answers. Uh, Kate Watson. I'm very glad that you're here, Father Radcliffe. Um, I know that at the start of the Synod, the night before, there was a gathering, the together gathering of the people of God, and there was a statement made that there's no ecumenism without synodality, and there's no synodality without ecumenism. And I was wondering if you could share um, whether there was an ecumenical element to the Synod and how it affected it, and also what sort of reflections out of the Synod on synodality that there might be for the ecumenical dimension of our church. Uh, Pope Francis wanted that ecumenism to be central, so we opened with uh, a long period of prayer, beginning in the afternoon, going right on to the evening. And you had the head of the Anglican community. You had uh, the patriarch from Istanbul, patriarch of Constantinople. You had the head of the Methodist Church. You had the head of the Baptist Church. Uh, you had, had the head of the charismatic renewal of the world. So everything opened with a meeting that was thoroughly ecumenical. And the delegates to the chapter included what they called fraternal delegates from all of those churches who stayed and spoke as a right of voice at the Synod. So we had some very passion, sorry, passionate speeches by the head of the worldwide head of the charismatic movement. There was the Anglican Bishop of Chichester, who spoke frequently and powerfully. There was a Greek Orthodox bishop, 
And I think, there was a, I think there was also a Russian Orthodox bishop. And they all spoke in the assembly. They weren't passive observers. So I think that that ecumenical dimension was absolutely central. I'm afraid I'm beginning to fade away uh, rather at the moment. How privileged have we been this evening? I was asked to share a few, a little short reflection. I am in no way attempting to compete with the erudite and extremely wise Father Timothy, but what are some of the things that I have heard this evening? Echoes of what Pope Francis urged us to do, to listen, and in doing so, to hear the Spirit. So this evening, I really do sense that we have been privileged to hear the quiet whisper of the Spirit. You do, for me, embody, Father Timothy, that inner restlessness, that urge for change. We heard it in our um, Q&A, the need for change, but also the need for wisdom and discernment as we go through that process. What else did I hear? Not to throw stones at your house, Your Grace. Um, I love that notion of walking in the way, and that's the, the breakdown of the meaning of the Greek, the synod, and it, that just makes incredible sense to me. The dignity of every Christian person, if not every person, is to be recognised and their voice is to be respected. That gives me hope in our church. And I love the definition of hope in desperate times connecting Pope Francis's ideas with Nick Cave's ideas, who's actually coming to Canberra in the next couple of weeks, and, of course, your ideas. And I think it's going to become a catchphrase for me that the Eucharist is our sign of hope in our tradition and in our faith. That means that the meaningless suffering will never have the last word. That is very, very cool. It's a banner. That's a banner. The power of silence, we experience that again ourselves, that enables us to listen and that the, the Synod has been more than what the media sold it as, as merely just a tussle and a power play. And your exposition of that, again, gives me hope as a member of our church. And that the Holy Spirit is that protagonist stirring change, creating that restlessness in the faithful. And the notion of friendship, of encounter, of faces, and of smiles, and that's my excuse for my lines, for moving us out of our comfort zones, forcing us to be daring, to be challenging each other and of ourselves. And then following that then, the notion of moving towards the truth with a capital T um, through discernment and thus leading to action. So I, I understand now fully what that process involves. And that notion of us being transformed as a church, as a community, of the faithful, the kingdom of the faithful, not only transformed in terms of who, but how we are. Some very, very powerful lines I've written down all over the place here in my notes. So where to next for us all? And I love that notion as an old English teacher of imagining, of being open to the possibilities, the notions of to think and discern and to absolutely respect um, things more than just hard stats and data and to listen to the wise voices of our theologians and to appreciate what they do do and to work in dialogue with others. And then you, send it, you wrapped up with that notion of then we've fallen out of love with the truth as a whole world. So let's fall back into love with the truth or as we say sometimes to face into the challenge of falling back into love with the truth and to do so together in a synodal, synodal fashion. So yes, tonight I am hopeful and filled with hope that the Holy Spirit is at work here, in our church, in the gatherings that are so important because it will shape who and how we are and that we will continue to pursue the truth um, and not dismiss any points of view or any voices 
and welcome all. So thank you so very, very much. I'm deeply moved by this evening. Now, as ever at Marici College, we always say thank yous at the end of a gathering. So I most definitely want to thank the Marici staff who have made this event possible. So Roz, who's around there, who hates being thanked, but she should be, Roz Parisi. <laughs> for Danny, you will um, be invited now to experience her wonderful hospitality and the supper that she has prepared for you. And as we like, we like to gather together in community, that is our tradition. Uh, Carly and Brooke, so Carly's one of our teachers and Brooke is one of our Year 12 students who are our tech experts and I think they've enabled us to be live streamed this evening which is wonderful. To our maintenance team who have set us all up beautifully. I also want to thank the CECG staff who stand there so humbly. There's Tiffany and there's Bernie. So thank you, you've done an awful lot of work to make these whole weeks possible and open up these experiences to so many of us, it's been invaluable. Of course, to Ross, thank you for inviting Father Timothy and getting in there before Pope Francis, we think. And, um, and to his grace for welcoming Father Tim Timothy so beautifully to your home. And um, of course, lastly and not leastly, to Father Timothy Radcliffe, may you long be heard and share your wisdom with so many. Thank you very much. Please enjoy supper.